you were here Sunday morning, I made mention in the sermon that tonight we were going to dig a little deeper uh, because I covered Mark 13 in its entirety in the sermon Sunday. And unfortunately, um, due to the constraints of time Sunday morning, we weren't able to get all of the questions answered that come from uh, this particular text. And so tonight I want to take just a few uh, short minutes and kind of deal with some of the issues that I, I know typically come up when this passage is talked about. And what you've got, I'll give you my notes. There's no fill in the blanks. You've got the same thing I've got. I've got nothing on my notes that's not on yours. And so I did that intentionally so that you would have everything in front of you. Now, I don't have as much on there as maybe you would have liked. But the first thing you'll see there is there's three columns. What you have in Mark 13 is known by New Testament scholars as the Olivet Discourse, otherwise known as the speech from the Mount of Olives. Um, this is Jesus talking from the Mount of Olives, um, and he does it in Mark 13, and he also does it in Matthew and Luke. Those three Gospels share a lot of similarities, a lot of things that they share, and they share this discourse. Now, there are differences. Don't let that freak you out, okay? That doesn't mean that one gets it right and one doesn't. All that means is, is that they are providing a complete picture. That's why I've given you all three on your handout there so that you can see. And what I try to do is go through and bold significant things that are in Matthew and Luke that aren't in Mark. So you'll see that sometimes the wording might be a little different, but it's no significant difference. But there are places where there is significant additional stuff. And so I give you this for your own benefit, so that as we talk tonight, as we look at what's going on here, we can see with clarity how all this fits together. When I was in uh, college, I took a class on uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because they're similar. That's what synoptic means. And I took a class on the Synoptic Gospels, and one of the things we had to do was we had to take a passage of Scripture that's in all three Gospels, and we had to compare it. That's basically what you've got there tonight. Because what you'll see, uh, most New Testament scholars believe Mark was written first. Mark is a disciple of Peter. He's getting information from Peter, and so he is writing Peter's Gospel. We call it Mark because Mark's the one writing it. Matthew, a disciple of Jesus, comes along and he writes his version of the events very similar to Mark's. In fact, a good chunk of Mark is in Matthew. So there's some who argue that he took Matthew's gospel or took Mark's gospel, copied the parts that he wanted to include in his version, and then added some additional material. Then you have Luke. Luke tells us, the beginning of Luke, chapter 1, that he went out and interview people. Luke was the physician, the traveling companion of Paul, that he goes out and he actually asks people, first-hand witnesses, of what's going on. So that explains why you have some similarities, you have some differences, because um, of, of how the Gospels came into existence. Mark was written first, and Matthew and Luke sometimes later. Um, that's what the vast majority of scholars would argue. So when we compare... Matthew, Mark, and Luke together. Typically what we do is we make Mark the basis. Mark's the shortest. Mark is the earliest. Then you compare Matthew and Luke together, which is what I've done. Take and do with that as you please. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll refer to some of these things here momentarily. But you see there, there's a lot. And you can just look at the length. I mean, you know, you've got three columns that, you know, two pages are the same, and then Mark is short, and then Matthew is long, and Luke is actually a little bit shorter, but the reason is because he starts off a little bit differently than Mark and Matthew do. Okay? That's why you have the differences in length. Um, I could do this for you in Greek, but that's not really important. So, okay. <laughs> My Greek skills are not what they used to be, I'll tell you that much. Okay. So, um, so anyway, so that's what you have there. So we'll look at this. I, I just give you that for your own information. So here are some things to keep in mind. So let's look at Mark 13. Um, 
to get our understanding. Because here's what happens, and this is, I've, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today about this. Uh, you hear a lot of stuff about end times. You hear um, books like the Left Behind series of books. You get other information. People will come out and say, well, this happened in the news, that must mean this. And, you know, Scripture's being fulfilled about the second coming and all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I think we need to make up our own mind as to what's actually going on. So let's look at Mark 13. This is, this is what we looked at Sunday. I just want to give us some context to understand some things. Okay, we'll begin at verse 3. It says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? So here's the question you have to ask yourself. What are the these things? <coughs> context is key for this. Okay? Just remember, if you take the text out of the context, all you have left is a comma. Okay, always remember that. Okay? Um, what's the context for these things? Because what Jesus is getting ready to tell us is in answer to a specific question. When will these things be? So if we know what the these things are, then we can understand what he's talking about. Well, the context is verses 1 and 2. Particularly verse 2. Jesus said to them, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left one here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Talking about the temple. So here are the these things. The these things are the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple. The temple in Jerusalem, originally built by Solomon, was destroyed by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar when they came into Jerusalem and, and destroyed the city and took the, the leaders into exile. And that's in the Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Talks about the consequences of that in Daniel. The prophets to deal with all that. That's a major thing in the Old Testament. At 586 B.C. is when that happens. Well, the, the, the exiles come back, and under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel, they rebuild the temple. But it's nothing like what it was under Solomon. And that, is, that becomes the temple for about 400 years. And there's a lot of history that goes on in that, and we'll talk about some of that in just a little bit. But then Herod the Great comes and he sits on the throne and he begins the process of remodeling. He doesn't tear the temple down. He doesn't rebuild it. So it's considered historically the same temple, but it's not the same temple. It's magnificent. It's huge. It's massively big, huge architectural accomplishment. Um, to keep from having to tear down the existing temple, which is a little tidbit of information, they train priests how to be stonemasons so they can work in the holy areas without <laughs> desecrating the holy places. So, um, so this is going on. Actually, the work was still going on when Jesus says this. The temple was not finished at this point. It was mostly finished, but it was not technically done until the 60s um, some scholars say 62, 63, somewhere in the early 60s A.D. In 66 A.D., the Jews revolt against the Romans. Okay? And the Romans don't take too kindly to that. So the Romans send in legions of soldiers, originally under uh, a man by the name of Vespasian, who ends up becoming the Roman emperor, and then his son Titus. And Titus lays siege to Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and he destroys the temple in 70 A.D. Since 70 A.D., there has been no temple in Jerusalem. Now, the platform, the temple mount, still exists. And in fact, there is an Islamic mosque on the temple mount. The Dome of the Rock is there. Okay? The walls of that platform still exist. The western wall of the Temple Mount is the holiest site in Judaism, 
It's called the Western Wall, or some call it the Wailing Wall. And you can go there, you can visit it, and you'll see people praying. It is against the law for a Jewish person to walk on the Temple Mount. Israeli law forbids it. Now, Christians and Muslims can do it. But Jews are not allowed to because the fear is you will step where the Holy of Holies once was and you will desecrate it. So they don't allow them. That's why they go to the wall. Okay? This area is where a lot of the conflict in Jerusalem and the Middle East happened. But the temple itself was destroyed in 70 AD. Okay, so most scholars argue that Mark is writing his gospel around 60 AD, before this happens. Okay, so the, the, these things that he's talking about is the destruction of the temple. I don't want to get into a percent, but I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of what Jesus is talking about in Mark 13 is directly tied to the destruction of the temple. Okay? I'll give you some examples. The very next verses where he says, though, people try to lead you astray. Verse 7, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse 8, nation will rise against nation. There'll be earthquakes and famines. It says, be on your guard. They'll turn you over to the authorities and you'll be hated for my name. Verse 14, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. All of this is related to the destruction of the temple. When you get to verse 24, there's a shift. I want you to make note of this. But in those days, in those days. So the first question is, what are these things? Destruction of the temple. Second question is, what are those days? And that is the return of Jesus, or as he refers to it, the coming of the Son of Man. Those days. So, what precedes the destruction of the temple? What are the signs for early Christians to understand the temple is about to be destroyed? That list there in verses 5 through 23. False Christs and prophets, wars and rumors of wars, nation will rise against nation, etc., and earthquakes, famines, persecution, and the spread of the gospel. And then he says... The immediate sign of the destruction of the temple will be the abomination of desolation. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, the vast majority of red letter Bibles make a mistake. Okay? Notice in verse 14, should have in parentheses in your notes. Let the reader understand. You see that? That is not something that Jesus probably said, but instead was added by Mark for his original audience to say, you've got to understand what's going on here. This phrase, abomination of desolation, can confuse people. I had a couple people ask me Sunday, why didn't you talk about this? I said, we'll talk about it Wednesday night. So what is this? This is not an unusual, unheard of phrase in the Bible. I think there's a historical reference that he's talking about with this. There's a scriptural reference, and then I think Jesus' reference is in something particular. The historical reference, and if I, I know I'm moving fast, so if you have questions, uh, I'll try to get done in time, maybe even ask some questions. The historical reference is to the events of the 2nd century B.C., when a Greek king by the name of Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes, erected a pagan altar in the temple. Now, um, if you know anything about the story of Hanukkah, if any of y'all familiar somewhat with the story of Hanukkah, it's not Jewish Christmas, okay? Just go ahead and spell that out. It's not Jewish Christmas. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John 10. It says that he was coming back from Jerusalem after going to the Feast of Dedication. That's Hanukkah. <coughs> Hanukkah is not in the Old Testament. So where did this come from? Well, it comes from the period in between the Old and the New Testament. In the mid-2nd century B.C., in the 100s, the Greeks controlled the land of Judea, and they wanted to make the Jews Greek. So this king, Antiochus Epiphanes, decided he was going to make the temple 
a Greek temple. So he erected a pagan altar in the temple and slaughtered a pig. Two big no-nos. Okay? Altar to someone other than God and an unclean animal to sacrifice. This triggered a revolt led by people like Judah Maccabees. And eventually they expelled the Greeks from Judea. And they needed to rededicate the temple. So they go in and they find that they only have enough oil to last one night. And the oil burns miraculously for eight nights. That's where Hanukkah comes from. It was the dedication of the temple following this revolt. The phrase, the abomination of desolation, or some variation thereof, was used from that point forward to refer to what Antiochus Epiphanes had done. When a pagan non-believer in God entered the temple and desecrated it. That's what he was referring to. That was the historical reference. Scripturally, there's places in Daniel that use that phrase that are prophetic foreshadowings of that event to, taking place two to three hundred years in the future from Daniel's time. Okay, that's a scriptural reference. That's why that phrase got used. So what's Jesus talking about when he uses that reference? He's talking about when the Romans enter into the city of Jerusalem and they desecrate the temple. He's basically saying, when you see the Romans show up in Jerusalem and they desecrate the temple, run. Get out of Dodge. Okay? In fact, Luke gives us that in his present presentation of it. Um, verse 20, yeah, sorry, I was, I was looking on too far. Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Luke makes that connection for us. And Mark doesn't. He says, let the reader understand. Matthew says, let the reader understand. Luke says, here's, here, here, here's the connection. Okay? Alright? So that is given as a reference. Okay? In verse 20 of Luke's telling of it. A lot of people hear that phrase, abomination and desolation, and they start thinking... One world government, new world order, battle of Armageddon. Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple. That's what he's talking about. That's the reference point for that. Now, to give you some historical uh, information here that's not in your notes, a church historian around the third, around the fourth century by the name of Eusebius writes the history of the church up until that point. He tells of how when <clears throat> The Roman armies begin to come closer to Jerusalem. Christians, knowing what Jesus had said, flee to the mountains. They get out of Jerusalem. And large groups of Christians are spared. The estimates of the number of people the Romans killed could be into the millions because the Romans surround the city at Passover. And so there's lots of people in Jerusalem that can't get out, and millions, possibly up to two million people, were killed during the siege of Jerusalem when the temple was destroyed. The Christians knew this was coming, and so they fled and survived because of what Jesus had said. Okay? So all those references about, you know, if, if you're pregnant, you know, if you pray it's not in winter, all that's referring to that historical event. So, what will precede the return of Jesus? Two things, based on what Jesus tells us here. Two things, the destruction of the temple. Has that happened? And Jesus. Okay, so if you're doing a checklist of what's got to happen for Jesus to come back, check mark destruction of the temple. Okay? The second is the spread of the gospel. It's the spread of the gospel. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay? The spread of the gospel is essential. Okay? It says to all nations. Now, nations, 
means ethnic groups, people groups. Okay? It will spread to all people. So when will Jesus return? We don't know. You know why we don't know? Because Jesus says there's no way that he can tell us because he didn't know. Only God the Father would know. Okay? Concerning that day and that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, so nobody knows. But we do know some things based on what Jesus has said to us about what the period of prior to the return of Jesus will be like. See, here's where I think a lot of American Christians make a mistake. Okay? And, and, and if you disagree with me on this, we can still go to church together and we'll go to heaven and we'll die and we'll die. Um, it's not a make or break issue, but I think it's a mistake in how we read the Bible if we think this way. That somehow history is going to just kind of progress as it's going, and then we're going to hit a point and a clock is going to start ticking of seven years, and then Jesus comes back. I don't see that. I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see that in how the Bible presents it. In fact, if you go to other parts of the world and you talk about the word tribulation, a lot of American Christians hear that and they think, oh, it's a period of time in the future. You go to some parts of the world, you hear the word tribulation, they'll say, oh, we're in it right now. We've been in this period since Jesus founded the church. Okay, the Bible uses the phrase that we're in the last days 2,000 years ago. Okay, this is not some kind of clock starts ticking and we can count down the days till the end. It's something that's ongoing now. But Jesus does give us a historical reference point. In Matthew 24, verses 37 through 41, Matthew includes this. He says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to remember. This is an analogy. And Jesus is saying, You want to know what it's going to be like when I come back? Look at how it was in the days of Noah. Let the days of Noah be your reference point. Okay? Just like if I were to say, you know, um, you celebrate an anniversary or something, it's going to be just like it was when you celebrated your anniversary last year. That's your reference point. Okay, so as it was in the days of Noah. So that's what we got. And he tells us what a little bit about that was like. He says, For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were all unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. Pay attention. This is important. Okay? Because this is a good example of where so many times we misread the Bible. Okay? What does it mean when it says they were marrying, giving, and marrying, and drinking? It means they were going through their normal life. Life was just happening. Until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and swept... Who got swept away? Everybody but who? <coughs> Noah and his family, right? Why? Why didn't they get swept away? They were in the ark. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay? Because then Jesus says, So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken... And one left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken, and one left. And here's my question for you. If the days of Noah and the flood are the reference point for when Jesus comes back, who gets taken and who gets left when Jesus comes back? Who got taken when the flood came? Those that sin, the unrighteous, who got left? The righteous. See where I'm going, right? Who's going to be taken away when Jesus comes back? Sinners, the unrighteous. Who's going to be left behind? Christians. 
I told this one time to a group of people, I said, I want to be left behind. And one, I thought one lady was going to pass out and have a heart attack. Okay? See, when we, when we get a bad picture of what's going to happen in the future, we begin to read into passages of Scripture stuff that's not there. Those verses that I just read are kind of classic rapture picture passages. You know, two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left behind. You know, um, two will be grinding, one will be taken, one will be, you know. We, 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 we get in this image, oh, it's the righteous people who get taken away because they don't get, it's not what Jesus says at all. In context, what Jesus says is, the people who are taken are the unrighteous people. Just like it was in the days of Noah. Who gets left behind? Noah and his family, the ones who found grace, the ones who were in the ark. In the flood, the story of the ark is a picture of our relationship with Jesus. Because it's only by getting inside the provision that God makes that we are spared the destruction that God brings. Jesus is like the ark. We get into him, we get into a relationship with him, we're safe. Okay, we're spared. Those that don't are destroyed. So you have life going on as normal, God's coming judgment, and the taking away of the wicked, and the leaving of the righteous. So what do we do with this knowledge of the return of Jesus? What do we do about this? One, we stay awake. We make sure we're ready. We've got to make sure we're ready. Okay? We've got to make sure we have a relationship with Jesus. And then we tell everyone we can about Jesus. You know, if we want Jesus to come back, we need to go tell everybody because he says the gospel will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. If we are serious about the return of Jesus, guess what we need to be doing? Telling everybody so that everybody that needs to hear will hear and Jesus can come back. Because that's why he's not come back yet. I mean, I, mean, I referenced it in the, in the sermon on Sunday. It's in 2 Peter. This was an issue in the early church. Peter deals with it. Um, you know, the church is going around saying Jesus is going to come back, Jesus is going to come back. And then some people are saying, they're scoffing and saying, oh, the day of the Lord has not come. Ha, 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 you silly Christians. And Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God doesn't reckon time the way we do. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. The reason Jesus hasn't come back yet is not because he's not coming back, but because he's waiting. He's waiting for you and me to go and tell people about Jesus. So that when all the people who need to hear the gospel hear the gospel, there's nothing keeping Jesus from coming back. Nothing. But what if the reason he's not come back is because we've not done our part? You know, I love the story in Acts when Jesus ascends because I think it captures so well so many times our attitudes toward things. Jesus tells the disciples, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And he said, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? That's a good question. They were just up. And the angel says, This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And then it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem. And they were too busy looking around up at the sky, just waiting for him to come back, when they had work to do. And the work they had to do was to go tell other people. I hope that answers some of your questions. I've got about 10 minutes. I talked fast, and I'm sorry. Um, as one man told me one time, it's not that I talk fast, it's some people hear slow. <laughs> so if I need to repeat something or explain something, or you have a question about something else in those passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, by all means, feel free to ask.
differently than what you just oh, yeah. said. Yeah. And you kind of have that, because I kind of thought like that, those books did, that we were going to be lifted up and not the opposite, that we would be here. So yeah. Well, and one of the things, too, you know, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, Paul's dealing with this, and I was going to bring those passages in, but for the interest of time, I didn't. But he's talking about how, you know, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and we will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible speaks of that. But here's what the mistake is. Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, and it seems like the church of Thessalonica misunderstands him because he didn't write 2 Thessalonians. And in chapter 2 he says, now wait a minute. What I told you in my previous letter, there's some other stuff I need to tell you so that you don't get confused. And he's talking about how... Um, he talks about the man of lawlessness or the man of perdition. Um, and, and as a whole, we can talk about all that, what that's all about. But he's basically saying there are certain things that will take place prior to the return of Jesus. But he makes it very clear that what he talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4 is one event. The dead in Christ rising, us being caught up in the air, Jesus coming back is all one event, not two things. The Left Behind series and other people who go along those, those lines, those are two things, two separate things. Um, there's a lot of history behind that theology that's fairly recent. The reason that theology is so prevalent in the United States is because of the Schofield Reference Bible. Um, John Darby developed what was known as dispensational theology, which is what that's based off of. It's a whole system of interpreting Scripture. He was basically ridiculed and called a heretic in England, which is where he was from. He gathered a few followers, a few students, one of which, they, the, through, through teaching of the information, it got to uh, Schofield, and when he did his study Bible, um, he put that in the notes. Well, the Schofield reference Bible spread like wildfire, because it was one of the best reference Bibles, the best study Bibles that you could buy at the time. There weren't many other options. And if people didn't have a lot of money, people didn't have access to a good theological library, this was a library in one book. Some of y'all probably have a Schofield reference Bible. Okay? Those study notes then become, you know, I heard a preacher say one time that they believed in the inerrancy of Scripture from Genesis to Max and the Schofield notes. Okay, that they believe that that has the same weight, it's the only, it's the only interpretation. And Tim LaHaye that wrote the Left Behind series, he was big into that theology system. Uh, but when you read scripture and you read it in context, I think it just kind of falls apart. Uh, I've got some good dispensationalist friends. We disagree. We argue back and forth over things. Um, and when they get to heaven, Jesus is going to tell them they're wrong. Um, but, you know, that's just, that's just the nature of it. But it's, it's become the dominant. Like, I, I taught this same thing in, in a church setting several years ago, and I had a gentleman come up to me afterwards, and he said he was never coming back because I was a heretic. And I said, prove to me why I'm a heretic. Prove to me from Scripture where anything I said was wrong. And he couldn't do it. And he, he, but he had bought into this system that interpreted Scripture wrongly. And there's passages in Daniel and Ezekiel that people will throw out and try to you know, prove their point. And they, and they miss it, I, I think. But I could be wrong too. Okay? I'm man enough to admit I'd be wrong. Any other questions? I thank you for this. I hope in a year or so you'll do it again. Well, I'm going to tell you something funny. It's funny you say that. You know, I mentioned back when we were doing the heaven study that I hadn't been your pastor long enough to do a study on the book of Revelation. That I was going to have to be here at least five years to have enough um, stamina and trust to go through that. Well, I look today at what the January winter Bible study is that Lifeway puts out. You know what it is? It's the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Which I've actually been praying about doing that as a standalone study. So maybe, just maybe, Lord willing, um, next year on Wednesday nights we might cover the book of Revelation. We'll see. Okay. We might get to the end of chapter 3, and I'm like, that's enough. <laughs> chapter 4 to the end, we'll do it later. 
principles there. But this is, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've taught this in classes, I've taught this in churches, and, the, and especially the days of Noah passage there, and, and that people are like, why have I never seen this? Because when you begin, when you, when you read in context, I remember I was sitting with my mom one day, and she was talking about something they didn't have at church, they had like a prophecy class or something, and, and I said, I just want you to read this passage, and I gave her the Bible, and she read that Matthew 24 passage, and she said, well, that's about the rapture. I said, read it again. And she read it three or four more times, and I could just see her eyes kind of open up, and she's like, why have, why have I never seen this before? And truth be told, if you read sermons from 150 years ago, this is what they were preaching. It's only been in recent years that we've screwed it up. So. Anybody got anything else? now forever hold your peace. I've got four minutes. I can't let you go too early. People will start talking. Okay. All right, then let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that tonight uh, we have seen something that maybe we've never seen before, but that it will affect us, that we live better uh, as believers in you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.